In this short video, we're going to talk about the integral test for infinite series. So we're going to develop a number of tests for convergence. When we first talked about series, we said that we have a two-step process to determine if the series is convergent or divergent. And from this two-step process, we would also be able to determine what the sum of the series is. We would first need to find a formula for the nth partial sum. It has to be a useful formula, not just the definition of the nth partial sum, because in our second step, we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth partial sum. So we need a useful formula to be able to evaluate that limit. However, it is usually really difficult to find a useful formula for the nth partial sum. But normally, we don't really need to know what the exact value of the sum is. We just need to know, does the series converge or does it diverge? And so we're going to spend the next few videos developing a number of tests determining if a series is convergent. And the first test we're going to use is called the integral test. So the integral test is based on the following idea. We need to have a function which is positive and decreasing, starting from some value. In this picture, we start at 1, going to infinity. And we need to have a sequence whose terms agree with this function on the counting number. So in other words, a sub 1 is f of 1, a sub 2 is f of 2, a sub 3 is f of 3, and so on. Now, what I've done is drawn some rectangles. All the rectangles are under the curve. And the area of each rectangle corresponds to a term of the sequence. So the area of my first rectangle is a sub 1 because its base is 1, and its height is a of 1, which is the same as f of 1. In the second rectangle, base is 1, the height is a sub 2, which is the same as f of 2, and so on. And so what I can say that if I have my terms of my series agreeing with the function on the counting numbers, then the sum of all of the series, would, all the terms in the series, would be the area of all of these rectangles. And so I'm going to have to pull out this a sub 1 because I'm going to say that the remaining rectangles, so the tail, which is what matters, they're going to add up to something which is less than the area under the curve, starting from 1 and going off to the right forever. That would be an improper integral, the improper integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx. So if I can evaluate this improper integral and determine that it's convergent with some value L, what does that mean? That means that my infinite series is bounded by a sub 1 plus L. And it's monotonic. I can even say it's an increasing sequence because all the terms are positive. So when I look at the nth partial sum, if I add one more term, it's going to increase. So I've got a sequence of partial sums which are bounded above by a sub 1 plus L, and they are increasing. And a bounded increasing sequence is going to be convergent. And so then I could say that the 
infinite series is also convergent. So I have this case, if I have a convergent improper integral, I will also have a convergent infinite series. Now I could look at the graph of this same function and draw my rectangles in a different way. So starting with the same height, but now drawing them going to the right rather than to the left. Why would I do that? Well, that would say that the area of all of the rectangles is going to be larger than the area under the curve. So now my uh, infinite series, it's going to be greater than, in fact, every partial sum would be greater than the prop proper integral from one to n of f of x dx. But then if the improper integral is divergent, that means that it's going to go off to infinity. We can then say that the series will be divergent as well. If I put those two ideas together, I come up with the integral test, which says that I need to have a function f which is continuous, it's positive, and it's decreasing, starting from some point going to infinity. We drew our pictures where we started with one going to infinity. What happens before this starting point with f doesn't really matter. Before um, one, meaning to the left of one, uh, f could be not continuous, it could be not positive, not decreasing, that doesn't matter. It has to be continuous, positive, and decreasing, starting from one and going to the right. And then, of course, we need to have our terms of our sequence to be the same as the function values at the counting numbers. And then we can say that if the improper integral is convergent, then so is the infinite series. And if the improper integral is divergent, then so is the series. And of course, there's nothing special about starting at the left endpoint one, I could replace uh, one with some positive integer k, and I'll get the same result. If the if I start from k to infinity, if that integral is convergent, then I would have to start from k to infinity in my uh, series. But again, a uh, point that we need to emphasize is that when we're trying to determine the convergence of an infinite series, what matters is the tail. If my first 17 terms are large, that doesn't matter. What matters is what happens from 18 to infinity. So let's look at some examples. For what values of p is the series from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the power of p convergent. Now we know when p equals 1, we have a harmonic series, and we're, we're going to be able to say that it is a divergent. But we can say even more now that we have the integral test, because if we use part 1 for the p-test for integrals, it says that the improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the power of p dx is convergent when p is greater than 1, and is divergent if p is less than or equal to 1. So we can directly apply the integral test now and get a test for convergence for the series so the series, where the terms are 1 over n to the power of p, is convergent when p is greater than 1, and it's divergent if p is less than or equal to 1. And we call that the p-test for series, or simply the p-test. 
We usually apply the p-test to series. So if we just say p-test, we mean the p-test for series. And this series where we just take the reciprocal of n to the power of p as our terms, that's called a p-series. So let's determine if this series is convergent or divergent. So I have n squared times e to the power of negative n cubed. We're going to use the integral test. And so I'm going to evaluate the improper integral from 1 to infinity of x squared e to the negative x cubed dx. So I'll replace the infinity with my parameter alpha. I'll make a u substitution. And for the moment, I'm just going to find the antiderivative. I'll fill in the limits later. So I just have to, to uh, find the antiderivative of negative one third e to the u, which will just be negative one third e to the u plus c. Or in terms of x, that's negative one third e to the power of negative x cubed plus c. So now let's put in the bounds and do the evaluation. And I get the following expression, which I don't like having the negative one third in front. So I'll distribute the negative sign into the brackets. And that will give me one over e minus one over e to the alpha cubed. That in brackets multiply by one third. So our second step would be to let alpha go to infinity. So 1 over e to the alpha cubed will go to 0. And so I'm left with 1 over 3e. Now I have to be careful here. This doesn't tell me anything about the sum of the series. The value of the improper integral is 1 over 3e, but we don't know how that is connected to the series, but it does tell us that the series is convergent. So let's look at another series. The terms of the series are 1 over n times square root of the natural log of n. Now we know that if I just had 1 over n, it would be divergent. But now the terms are actually getting smaller because we're multiplying n times radical natural log of n and then taking the reciprocal. So is this going to give us a convergent series? Well, let's use the integral test. I'm going to have as my integrand 1 over x times the radical natural log of x. Note that we have to start with n equals 2 because the formula would be undefined when n equals 0. I'm sorry, when n equals 1, because natural log of n would be 0. So no problem. We can start with really any uh, counting number here. So we're going to start with 2. So I need to replace my infinity with the parameter alpha as the upper bound. Let's make a u substitution. So now I'll need to evaluate the integral of 1 over radical u du. So I'll change that to a power, use the power rule, and change back to x, which would be then 2 radical natural log of x plus c. That's my antiderivative. So now I can apply the bounds and evaluate that. And I'll get the expression 2 in parentheses, radical natural log of alpha minus radical natural log of 2. And now when I let alpha go to infinity, well, the natural log of alpha grows without bounds. And then when I take the radical of it, it's still going to grow without bounds. So this improper integral is divergent. So the sum or the series is going to be divergent as well. Now, we may want to use a partial sum. Maybe we need to, to have an idea of what the 
uh, value is of the infinite series. And we can't find any reasonable formula for the nth partial sum to find the exact value of the sum. So we use an approximation. We take a finite number of terms and we say, well, that I'll use as my approximation. Now, in the case that we've been looking at, where we have a positive decreasing continuous function f, and the terms of the series are the function values at the corresponding counting number, we can use the same logic from the integral test to estimate the remainder between the full sum and the partial sum. So in this case, the partial sums are increasing as n increases. And so the full sum, if we know that this is a convergent series, of course it will have a full sum, is going to be larger than then the partial sum. And we'd like to have an idea of, well, how, how close are we? What is the, the remainder? Or not, what is the remainder? But can I at least determine upper and lower bounds for the remainder so I have an idea about how close I am to the full sum? So we're not going to use the integral test as it is stated, because that only tests for convergence. But we can use the same ideas that we used for the integral test. So to do that, let's realize that the remainder in this case is just going to be the sum of the tail. So start, sum of the rest of the terms starting with the n plus 1 term and going to infinity. So if I look at the graph of my function f, and now I start where x equals n and goes to infinity, I can draw rectangles as I did before, and I can see that the area of this first rectangle is going to be the first term in the tail. It's going to be a sub n plus 1. Why? Well, we know that the width is 1, and the height is going to be uh, f of n plus 1, which is the same as a sub n plus 1. And so the second rectangle would be the next term, and so on forever. And so the remainder would be the sum of the areas of all these rectangles, but that's going to be smaller than the integral the improper integral of f of x dx starting from n and going to infinity. So I know that my remainder is going to be smaller than the value of that improper integral. Now on the other hand, I have to look at the same function, same graph of the function, but draw my rectangles going off to the right. That means that Again, the sum of the area of all these rectangles is going to be our remainder. It is going to be the tail of this infinite series. Uh, but it's going to be larger than the area under the curve, starting from n plus 1. So over here we started with n. Here we're starting with n plus 1. And that tells me that my remainder is bounded below by the value of this improper integral where we start from n plus 1 and go to infinity. And so that gives us our bounds on the remainder. So let's use this remainder estimate. We're going to first estimate the full sum of the infinite series, where the terms are n over e to the power of n. So I'm not going to go through and show that this is a convergent uh, infinite series. We could actually use the integral test 
uh, with integration by parts to show that it is a convergent uh, infinite series. But let me just start and say I'd like to estimate the sum or approximate the sum using the fifth partial sum. So I pull out my calculator and I calculate the first five terms, add them up, and I get 0 0.89. Four, eight, six. So that is too small, but about how too how how much is it off? What is the remainder? Well, I don't know the remainder exactly. If I knew the exact remainder, obviously I would be able to calculate the exact sum. But I can use our formula for the bounds on the remainder it's going to be greater than the, the value of the improper integral from 6 to infinity of x e to the negative x dx. And it'll be smaller than the improper integral from 5 to infinity of x e to the negative x. So I'm not going to show all the details, but you can use integration by parts and show that the uh, integral from n to infinity of x e to the negative x dx is convergent and it converges to the value n plus 1 over e to the power of n. So that tells me that the remainder, so the difference between the fifth partial sum and the full sum is between 7 over e to the power of 6 and 6 over e to the power of 5. And those are approximately about 0.017 and 0 0.040. So that tells me that my, uh, I've got at least one uh, decimal place of uh, correctness in my fifth partial sum, my fifth partial sum. So the full sum is going to be, you know, something like 0 0.9 something. So how many terms are needed to ensure that my remainder is smaller than 10 to the minus sixth? Well, I would like to be able to solve you know, this upper bound being less than 10 to the minus 6, right? The upper bound is n plus 1 over e to the n. That's the integral from n to infinity of x e to the negative x dx. But I can't solve that e equation explicitly. So what I did instead is say, well, let me just make a table of values. I don't have to look at all of the values of x, uh, I just need to look at the counting number. So I'm going to start with n equals 10 and go from n equals 20. And I see that my bound, of course, gets smaller and smaller. And I'm only looking for the first value of n where the upper bound is smaller than 10 to the minus 6. And that's going to occur when n equals 17. Uh, it's going to be smaller than 7.5 times 10 to the negative uh, 7. And so that tells me that I would need to take 17 terms if I want to get an, an estimate where the remainder is smaller than 10 to the minus 6. Well, when I know for sure. And just um, for fun, I use some technology to calculate um, so this is just a by the way, right? By the way. The 100th partial sum is about uh, 0 0.91. And uh, that is uh, actually um, 
pushing the bounds of uh, the technology that I have to, to calculate that. So that's going to be very, very close to the actual um, sum. And we can see that our, our original estimate using only five terms, uh, which is, gave me 0 0.89. Well, again, it was correct to one decimal place. So we'll need more tests than the integral test. As you can see, it's very limited. You need to have that a function which is continuous, decreasing, and positive uh, on that uh, interval starting from uh, 1 and going to infinity or some other number and going to infinity. So in the next few videos, we'll develop some other tests that will still need positive terms but we can apply them to uh, different types of uh, infinite series.